Welcome to event three of the book club. Um, people will still be popping in, I'm sure, as we uh, get started here, but um, I thought I'd begin with the uh, introductions to today's event. Um, we can move on to our discussion. So, my name is uh, Stephen Young. I'm an associate, um, uh, hang on a second, associate professor, I almost forgot that, I'm an associate professor of geography and international studies here at UW-Madison. I'm also the faculty director of IRIS NRC. We are uh, one of the centers on campus that is funded by the US Department of Education with a mission to offer programming and expertise to K-12 and post-secondary educators, students and the community at large to inspire informed thinking about complex and cross-regional issues in our world. You can find more information about our events at our website, uh, irisnrc.com, uh, and you'll find presentations and conversations with artists, academics, activists, and much more. Today's event is being co-sponsored by the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice, the Center for Southeast Asia, and the Department of Anthropology at UW-Madison. So thank you to all of our co-sponsors. Uh, Claire will be running the tech today. Um, she is in the control tower, ready to help if you have any challenges using the chat function. You can contact her. Um, there will be a recording of today's event uh, that we can share with people uh, who registered but could not attend at this time. Uh, but you'll only show on this recording if your microphone is turned on to speak. Before we get to the main event, I want to acknowledge that the University of Wisconsin-Madison occupies ancestral Ho-Chunk land, a place their nation has called De Jope since time immemorial. In an 1832 treaty, the Ho-Chunk were forced to cede this territory. Decades of ethnic cleansing followed when both federal and state government repeatedly but unsuccessfully sought to forcibly remove the Ho-Chunk from Wisconsin. This history of colonization informs our shared future of collaboration and innovation. Today, UW-Madison respects the inherent sovereignty of the Ho-Chunk Nation along with 11 other First Nations of Wisconsin. So, on to today's event. Um, We've already had a, a couple of, of sessions talking about the dawn of everything. In that first session, uh, we were focusing on the, open, the introduction and the opening couple of chapters, thinking about um, the argument presented by the authors that even in the contemporary moment, people tend to make arguments about the sort of social inequality and its origins, drawing on Rousseau and Hobbes and the sort of work that was being done hundreds of years ago in Europe and Kate, uh, Katie Robiadek, who's here with us again today. Hello, Katie. Um, led us through a sort of uh, a discussion about uh, and some thoughts about uh, some of that, that thinking that was emerging in Europe at that time. Uh, last week, uh, uh, we talked about the, the problems with the standard understanding of the sort of Paleolithic and Neolithic revolution. Did, uh, you know, what was really happening over the course of thousands of years, the authors argue, was that, you know, people were taking up farming, but not wholesale, sometimes abandoning it altogether, and that it hop, skipped, and jumped around the world rather than it being some inexorable sort of march of, of, of farming and, 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 and agricultural settlements um, as perhaps we used to think. Uh, today, we're going to be uh, thinking about uh, questions around cities and questions around political uh, inequality and thinking about whether there really is a relationship between uh, cities and political uh, hierarchy, which is the focus of chapters nine and 10 uh, in the book. I'm delighted that we have two more faculty members from our own uh, Department of Anthropology um, to help us with the discussion today. One of them is uh, Mark Knoyer, a professor here who has been excavating and carrying out research on the Indus civilization since 1975 and has excavated this at the site of Harappa, Pakistan since, 1980, uh, uh, since 1986. He's also worked at sites and ethno-archaeological projects in India and more recently in China and Oman. He has a special interest in ancient technologies and crafts, socio-economic and political organization, as well as religion. And these interests have led him to study a broad range of cultural periods in South Asia, as well as other regions of the world. As part of his research on ancient bead technologies, he has undertaken studies of collections throughout the world with a special focus on West Asia, China, Taiwan, Japan, Korea, and Southeast Asia. And in 2011, he was elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. 
He's published a number of monographs on the Indus civilization, as well as articles, also a grade school book on ancient South Asia, and even a coloring book on the Indus cities for children. Um, and I'm going to make sure we get Mark back uh, when his, his latest publication is, is uh, widely available here to talk about it, because it's a really fantastic piece of work. We also have uh, Sarah Clayton, a professor of anthropology here at UWM. Um, uh, professor Clayton is interested in the development, social structure and decline of the world's earliest urban states. In particular, she studies the interactions between urban and rural sectors of society and the way in which the evolution of cities transforms surrounding landscapes and ways of life. She is an active field researcher in central Mexico, where she investigates the regional organization and cultural legacy of Teotihuacan, one of the earliest complex states of the largest city of its time in the Western Hemisphere. Migration, identity, and ethnogenesis are major themes of her work, uh, which of which explores the salience of social diversity in processes of state formation and dissolution. Um, those are our, our speakers. Uh, I know that last week we heard from uh, Cecil Schrader as well, and I'm delighted that she's also um, uh, here in the room again uh, uh, with us this week to uh, provide um, more, I hope, uh, insightful comments and thoughts on uh, the, this section of the book that we'll be reading. But for now, let me say by way of introduction that about 18 months ago, just after uh, the dawn of everything had come out, I was reading the New York Review of Books and there was a review in there um, by uh, Kwame Anthony Appiah, uh, which was in which the work of Mark Kanoya was being discussed and debated in terms of wrangling over the interpretation of, of, of the evidence in one section of the book. And at that moment, when we started thinking about doing this book club, I thought I'd be really interested to know what Mark makes of this text and some of these um, points of controversy. We're about to find out. Welcome, uh, Mark, and, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Steve, for inviting me. And also thank you, everybody, for joining. And I don't know how many of you have read the chapter in great detail, but basically chapter eight is talking about early cities. And um, this is a topic that's quite complicated, and it's something that people have been talking about for a long time. Uh, one of the, I think, big issues that I have with this book, I mean, I bought it immediately when I heard about, somebody emailed me and said, your your name is in the New York Times review, da, 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 da. so I had to immediately buy the book and start reading it, and um, I'm not going to go to all details about the issue. I think the main thing to think about is, is the authors have tried to question some of the Western perceptions of how early Western archaeological perceptions of how cities were conceived. And these were based on biblical concepts and uh, things that were embedded in Western academic thought about from, from Greek and, and the earlier biblical concepts of what a city was. So many people think of Jericho as a city because Joshua walked around the city walls and they shouted three times and the walls fell down. Well, in my opinion, Jericho is not a city. It's a, a small town. A small town is a part of a larger urban landscape, but Jericho is not a city. It was a village, eventually had a wall around it, and it became part of an urban complex where Jerusalem was the main city, but Jericho was a small rural town that was linked to a city. So when we think about cities, one of the first things I have, I mean, I have to discuss in this concept is they, they present cities, but they don't give a definition of what they think a city is. And a city is a very complicated term, and everybody in the world defines it differently. So we, as archaeologists, when we talk about cities, and I'm excavating a city called Harappa, and I'm trying to find out when that settlement became a city. I have stone tools that date to 10,000 BC, which were from that date. So just because Paleolithic people lived there at 10,000 BC doesn't make it a city. Um, but that means that the city has been there for 10,000 years. If you start looking at that kind of evidence, there were people living there at Harappa at 7,000 BC. So they were still living in that same area. And from 10, that's 3,000 years of people inhabiting that spot. We have a village there at 4,000 BC. We don't know how big it is, but we know that that village expanded to over 10 hectares. How many people can fit in a 10 hectare area? 
necessary. And these are the issues that they talk about in their, their book, but they don't discuss how archaeologists identify population density. And um, we know that that settlement eventually split. Why does a village split into two sections? And what, what, what are the political events that happen that conflict? When a village splits in two sections, I see that the beginning of hierarchy. So it's, it's not, not a big settlement, but when it splits, it begins to expand the, the split off section, expands larger. And now you have two 10 hectare regions right next to each other, but they're sided. And so when you have a lot of people living in one part of the site and a lot of people living in the other sites, part of the site, it suggests that there is a diversity of opinion about how we organize our space, how we deal with each other. And we don't want to live together, but we're not that, we're not enemies. We're not going to kill each other. So Harappa, we can see that whole process. And Harappa is one of the only sites in the world where we've been able to see that from 10,000 BC to 7,000 BC to 4,000 to 2800 BC, and at 2800, they built a wall around those two separate villages. The walls were built around the villages, but they were within a stone's throw of each other. So these walls were clearly not for defense, but they were to control and limit people's access. None of that's discussed in the book. All of that has been published since 1996. So they had the opportunity to read it, but none of it's discussed in this book at all. So they looked at an article that I wrote in 1998, which was a general textbook for an exhibit that I had here in Madison. And then they looked at some other articles that some people wrote, including somebody who argued for egalitarianism in Indus cities. Egalitarianism in Indus cities has been argued because the cities had equal access to resources without, throughout the city. And this was argued from the very beginning of their discovery in the 1930s. In Mesopotamian cities, the streets go from the gateway to the temple, temple to the palace, and palace back to the gateway. And every neighborhood is built up around those structures. So everybody in the city did not have equal access to resources. There were no centralized drainage systems. There was no way to, for removal of waste. Whereas in the cities, we have north, south, east, west streets, big wide streets that have two-way traffic of ox carts that are eight meters wide. Some of them have dividers in between them so that you can only go one way on one side and one way on the other side. And then you have uh, evidence for city drains, that the sewage out, the, out of the city, so neighborhoods are kept clean. And because all of the city has the same structure, some people argue that this demonstrates egalitarianism. Actually, we have some very big houses with many, many rooms, and then some itsy bitsy little houses with only two or three rooms. So that to me doesn't reflect. Some people are very powerful, have lots of retainers, and other people don't. None of those big buildings were called palaces because we didn't find gold or jewels or things stored in them. And part of the reason is because in Indus cities, none of the Indus cities were ever destroyed by warfare. All the discoveries in the Near East, in Knossos, in Greek cities, anywhere in the world where people find treasures, it's because of warfare. So people come in, destroy the city, burn it down, and things are lost. If people are continuously living in the city for 700 years, you just don't find gold laying around in areas. Occasionally you'll find a hoard, but it's not the result of being lost in warfare. So this is one of the differences between Indus cities and the other cities in the, in the ancient world. So in the end, egalitarianism, whether you see, I mean, we have lots of evidence for hierarchy. We have it in the forms of burials. We have it in the form of ornaments. We have it in the form of house styles. And a whole range of things can show us that there is a very strong hierarchical society in the Indus. And I've written on this extensively. So that's kind of what the New York Times reviewer was commenting on is that these authors basically ignored 40 years of my writing and other people's writing, which was about the end of civilization, which and took one article, which was not very well articulated, and which said, well, they might have been egalitarian. Um, but then again, we know that early city had a general population that helped to reinforce the structure of the, the uh, ruling authority. In the Indus, because we do not have 
palaces that we can identify as palaces. We assume that there was a corporate structure. And this kind of corporate structure has been argued by Carrie Feynman and other scholars in Mesoamerica as being one mechanism for ruling. So you can have a monarchy where you have a single ruler, and then you can have a corporate structure where you have competing elites. So in the Indus, we've come at that from a different angle where I argue that the elites are merchants, landowners, and ritual specialists, three people who would have power over something, economics, ideology, or uh, some aspect of, of subsistence, but we don't have evidence for military control and military power as being used as a form of integration. So in the Indus cities, I argue that we have a dispersed authority that was competing for power and changing, and people may have been member of the city, which becomes, they become citizens, but I doubt that people who were living outside of the city um, were wealthy enough to come in and just buy a house anytime they wanted to. So egalitarian means that I can come in there and I can settle when I want to. Because you had to go through a gateway. Sometimes you had to go through multiple gateways to get to certain areas in the cities. And that would mean requiring people to pay taxes or to conform to some of the, the, the regulations of those urban centers. And probably one of the most important features of Indus cities that people often forget is that when the ruling elite of Indus cities no longer had power, all of the symbols of their power were basically obliterated from Indian history. Okay, so ruling elites of Indus cities used a unicorn motif on their seals. These were this motif for the probably the tax collectors and the people who were monitoring. The unicorn disappears at a 1900 in India's Indian iconography. It doesn't appear in later iconography at all. It continued in Mesopotamia and spread to the Mediterranean and eventually to Europe, but it was not used in South Asia. But the, the Indus people invented it. They used it for six, 700 years, and then it disappears. They developed certain types of seals. Those stopped being used. They developed a writing system. That stopped being used. People do not just immediately obliterate the memory of a ruling elite that's been there for 700 years unless they had a problem with it. That's something that's really controlling in a very uh, authoritative way and definitely in a hierarchical context. And so that's one of my, the strongest arguments that I have that the Indus cities were hierarchical and that they were maintained rigorously by uh, a very strong social system and ideological system. And when the rulers who were controlling that were no longer able to sustain it by agriculture or other mechanisms, people walked away and people forgot it and they did not want to remember it. In fact, there were a thousand years of proscription of writing. So the Vedic culture forbade writing. They did not allow people to write for 1,000 years in South Asia. And it wasn't until a thousand years later that writing starts being used again. They knew that their writing exists. There was writing in Arabia, there was writing in Iran, there was writing in Central Asia, but they did not want to use writing. And so they were clearly opposed to the writing because writing linked that to the earlier Indus elites who were using writing as a way to stamp goods and to control. So these are some of the interesting things that I wanted to present to think about the context of some of the, the things that they discussed. And you know, if people want to talk about cities, um, that's another topic, and I'm sure that Sarah has her suggestions or comments based on the area of Teotihuacan, because they talk about Teotihuacan in much of the same ways that they talk about the Indus and Mesopotamia, uh, which is, to me, kind of superficial and kind of um, smoke and mirrors, dropping name, talking articles and re resources that very, very few people would have access to, um, but they are important, they're interesting. But when you start digging in with the archaeology of those regions, everybody knew that Mesopotamian cities had a public that had an opinion that didn't always and ruled for a short period of time, and they were usually overthrown. And, you know, monarchies were short-lived and empires were short-lived. So 200 years, I just lectured today in my intro class about Sargon of Akkad. He took power by warfare. After him, his son ruled for a while. By the time his grandson came around, boom, the, the empire was gone because they could not integrate that large area for a long period of time. So that's kind of my spiel about some of the things that I think were 
interesting and brought to mind when I read the, the, the charges. So I'm not sure what you want to do, man. Yeah, that was fantastic. Thank you so much. Before we open it up for general comments and questions, uh, I'll hand over to um, Sarah um, for your thoughts, Sarah, on uh, particularly in terms of the, the treatment of um, Central Mexico in the book. All right, um, thank you. It's nice to be here. I'm excited to be part of this conversation. It's such a pleasure to see all of you and to see some of my colleagues from anthropology. Um, I actually didn't know that most of us in our archaeology section in our department were participating in this until I just looked the other day at the, the sort of promotion for this on the website. So that, that's so fun to see. So um, I, I will say I am enjoying this book, meaning I admit that I haven't finished it. It's impressive. It's ambitious. It's sweeping and still manages to be pretty detailed. So um, I I can say, you know, I've been working at Teotihuacan, focusing on Teotihuacan and Mesoamerica for over 15 years now. And so my attention went pretty directly to that chapter. And that's that's where most of my comments are going to be focused. But, um, you know, reading that, I, I expected to find a lot to criticize. And I did, of course. Right? There's a fair bit of cherry picking in there, a, a bit of relying on outdated literature, similar to the, the situation for the Indus discussion that, that Mark was, was relaying a moment ago. Um, but I, I wanna start, instead of going right into the criticisms, uh, I wanna talk about what I appreciate about this book just really quickly, and then we can dive into these bigger issues. But uh, I think it's something to celebrate and really refreshing when a book about archeology, span especially one this dense, um, manages to spark the interest of a broader public audience. I think that's wonderful. Um, and what I like about this is that it conveys the excitement and the potential of this discipline um, for really addressing some of the big questions we have about our human history. Because I think all too often, many people when they're exposed to archaeology, it's kind of presented as a as a sort of series of isolated discoveries that are interesting and cool, you know, like the oldest rock art or the earliest canoe in the region or a cache of weapons, you know, and this is all fascinating, but the broader implications don't come through all of the time. So we, I think the general public uh, often doesn't appreciate that that we are building information that, hel that helps us to understand our human story rather than just discovering neat things. And so I just wanna say that, um, that archeology span is helping us to understand our major transformations in our, in our human history and why it is that we live the way that we do. And then the cool thing about this book is it pushes a step further by challenging a lot of the assumptions that have come from popular ideas about the past, as well as from a long history of archeological research. And so challenging some of the ways we've been thinking about the past to generate information that's not only interesting, but potentially useful for addressing some of the, the, the problems that we might face in our uncertain futures as a society related to climate change, related to social inequality. So all good things. Uh, when it comes to the discussion of Teotihuacan, I think it's, um, I look at this a bit like a, an image that from a distance it looks nice, but upon closer examination, it becomes increasingly pixelated. You know, if you look at the details, like we can see in the large map, there's all of these huge compounds that people were living in. These are kind of large, similarly shaped places spread across the city. So this gives us kind of the general image of people living in relative equality and, and comfort. But when we look closely at the empirical evidence, and we look closely at how, how we've examined those places archeologically at those details, that, that, that the picture sort of starts to become more complicated, right? So um, my, my take on the Teotihuacan chapter is that it, it paints a rather rosy picture that's worth looking into, compelling, compelling as a hypothesis, but it's it's basically telling us that um, Teotihuacan at its height was a sort of utopia um, with in which citizens were equal. It lacked 
centralized rulership, and they make some pretty strong statements to this effect. It's not just implying that there was, you know, a sort of collective rule, but there are statements about, you know, not a shred of evidence for uh, the institutions of kingship or top-down authority. Um, so I, I think that's that's a bit problematic. Um, and I so centralized rulership being absent, citizens being equal, and all of them living out their lives in, in basically palatial comfort. These are some hypotheses, and they're treating them as as sort of conclusions. And so I want to get into this, and I especially appreciated uh, Mark's discussion about governance, forms of governance in early cities, and about social inequality. And I'm hoping to hear from, you know, I'm interested in sharing my thoughts, but I want to hear from everybody else here, what their thoughts are about how archaeologically or historically, perhaps based on multiple lines of evidence, we can begin to understand and reconstruct um, the situation in different societies in terms of social organization, how it shifted through time, and uh, social inequality and political organization. So um, governance, especially. There seems to be a desired narrative here of relative egalitarianism which is a, a lovely idea, and I think it's worth, I'm not completely dismissing, by the way, the idea of collective, forms of collective governance, um, but we also can't be dismissive of evidence to the contrary, which I think is something that, that Dr. Knoyer was, was pointing out very effectively a moment ago. So I guess I'll, I'll leave the, my comments there and, and hoping to just kind of open it up for discussion and questions around those themes, urbanism, governance, and social inequality. Thank you so much, uh, Sarah, for those, uh, those thoughts. Um, I'd love to hear, Cecil, if, if you would be willing, um, you, you did so much of the, the work of guiding us through the chapters last week for some, some thoughts on this. Um, uh, question in the book as well though so um let's go to you next and then also claire you can open it up so that um people can start to unmute but cecil welcome back um one of the th you know i really liked what my colleagues had to say about the importance of really looking at closely at the archaeological evidence and as they um especially as uh as sarah was talking about sort of the map of teotihuacan we as archaeologists present city layouts or community layouts as if everything that you would, everything that's represented on that layout was in use and existed at the same time. And that can give a false sense of complexity, um, hierarchy that may not be really the case. And that's why it's so important to really look at the archaeological evidence for the use of the different areas within the community are they really all contemporaneous or do you see is is some of this idea of of equity or lack of hierarchy because all the architecture looks the same is it more because it's been it's the same people building the same kind of architecture in different parts of the community um, and that's one of the issues with Cahokia which some people considered to be a city, um, certainly, you know, 15 plus thousand people living in the community at one time. Uh, that's that community, that city gets mapped as if all parts of it were in use at the same time. And yet the archaeological evidence clearly indicates that's not the case. And it even indicates that some mounds went through periods of being ignored, not used at all. And including Monk's Mound, the largest earthwork north of Mexico. Um, and so really paying close attention to the way in which a community's occupation history changed through time, you know, its, it's occupation evolved is important to deciphering the complexity question. Thank you, Cecil. Um, so at this point, I would simply say to the, everybody else in the room, Lord knows I've got my questions, but we don't want to hear from me yet. Um, but I would uh, invite anybody who is here with the with the 
um, comment simply that we have access for another 30 minutes to some incredible uh, expertise from different parts of the world uh, to offer your own thoughts, your own comments, reflections, and also to maybe propose some questions that we can collect and, and think about uh, in the remainder of our discussion. Yes. Oh, sorry, Sarah, was there something you wanted to say? I just um, I wanted to comment on on Cecil's uh, reference to the map and and how this gives us the idea that everything was occupied at the same time. I think that is that's just so spot on. And the other thing I think that maps do is is kind of um, give us the sense, like the Teotihuacan map. That's a famous map. It was made in the '60s. It's been reproduced so many times. It's constantly being published. So they it gives us a sense about knowing a city knowing a settlement that I, I think it a, a sort of false sense of security in our in our knowledge in our state of knowledge of of what these compounds look like they're little squares on a map there are 2300 of them at Teotihuacan and just to give you an idea um, of our sample I would say it's one percent in terms of extensive excavation perhaps 20 of these have been thoroughly excavated that's our sample. That's a really small sample. There's so much work to do. So even though that map is reproduced so often, there's still so much about that city that we don't know. And, and kind of following up on that point, one of the reasons I think that, uh, that these living conditions at Teotihuacan are described as palatial, and that the understanding is that most people lived in comfortable palatial places is that archaeologists have mostly, at least starting in the, the sort of mid uh, 20th century, have mostly selected palatial complexes for excavation. So, and specifically at Teotihuacan, the early history of excavation, extensive excavation of living complexes, living uh, residential compounds, was uh, the, the pattern was to select places that had evidence of beautiful mural paintings. And so the result has been to, to view these places as, as sort of equal in their, in their, uh, their quality and their beauty and um, as very comfortable places. And this, so our knowledge is really a product of, of the ways we've conducted archeological research and that's changing now, we're revising our views. Um, the other point is that we have tend to, tended to focus on compound architecture there uh, because it is so visible. We see the remains of concrete and stone and mounded remains on the surface, fragments of pottery. There were insubstantial structures as well that have received far less attention and are not mentioned in this chapter at all in this book. So structures that would be more ephemeral, more difficult to detect archaeologically, made of wattle and daub, so a combination of mud and wood and reeds made of adobe. Uh, it's been estimated in more recent research that a, like a significant minority of this population lived in these insubstantial structures. But if we just don't consider them, you know, then it looks like everybody's quite comfortable. So it really gives us a skewed view of what life was probably like uh, within this city. And I know we've, we've got another comment, so I'll stop there. No, thank you, Sarah. Uh, uh, Jennifer, you should be able to unmute yourself. Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for bringing together all of this expertise um, to talk about these issues. Um, my own uh, archaeological experiences in the Middle East, and I, I work, um, some of my research is on the site of Uruk, the first, the first city in Mesopotamia. And I was wondering, uh, one of the things they talk about in Chapter 8 is something about Mesopotamia sort of missing technologies, that that was evidence for egalitarianism, that, that because Mesopotamia didn't have metallurgical furnaces and things like that, that, that it somehow shows a degree of equality or a lack of social inequality. And I, I was struck by the idea that archaeologists are always working with less evidence than we would like, and that, that for us, the absence of evidence is evidence also. Um, but I wondered if if you felt for your two uh, regions, if in some ways they're kind of playing fast and loose with the absence of evidence and using that as evidence for social equality. I'm thinking about 
you know, the, the undeciphered nature of Indus writing and the lack of, of written evidence at Teotihuacan and, and, and elsewhere, that, that somehow that lack of evidence can for them be evidence, but ways in which I think those of us who are experts in particular areas are really uncomfortable with. Thank you very much. Um, I totally agree. Um, I mean, they do briefly say that the main excavations in Mesopotamia were obviously palaces and temples, and nothing has been excavated outside that region. But um, we do know from surface surveys that there are furnaces in various parts of the sites. We know that there's lots of craft activities. In our work at Harappa, we specifically focused on finding those places and excavating them. So we were able to fill in that data to show that there are different areas, both within the walled sector of the city, as well as outside the walled sector of the city, which unfortunately, you know, these are these concepts of how many, why are so many people living outside the wall of Harappa? We have clear evidence of structures of what we'd call caravans, right? Um, so if you are living outside of a city wall, there's a reason. You either don't want to pay taxes or you can't afford to live inside the city or you're excluded because of your ethnicity or because of the fact that you have, you know, livestock and other things that are not allowed in the city. So there's many different reasons for why people live inside of a wall and outside of a wall. And clearly people living outside the wall are at a different status than people living on the top of the mound that get a fine breeze every day and uh, don't have to have the smoke from kilns and furnaces and burning dump uh, in their backyard. So these are important differences that we can see as uh, we excavate the site. I mean, in terms of even people living in the city, our excavations at Harappa were able to show that some parts of the city were basically abandoned while other parts were being renovated and built up. I have the entire carcass of a cow sitting outside of a person's house, rotting on the street until it got buried with garbage. Nobody's living in that house. That's why somebody threw a carcass of a cow in the street. So clearly that neighborhood was not being occupied at that time. And then eventually somebody and paves it over and lays a new drain and makes a nice neighborhood. But that was, you know, hundreds of years later, probably, or at least 100 years until this got covered up with debris. So those are fluctuations within a walled area. So even when you count how many walls and how many houses are in a wall, you can't estimate population. It's really hard to define how many people live within an area. Uh, Alberto, did you want to, and, and we can return to any of these questions, and um, of course, as we're going through, but Alberto, would you like to well, ask something? Well, uh, all right, yeah, yeah, thank you. I mean, uh, first of all, I, I, I commend the Iris NRC for convening this book, group. I'm enjoying it a lot. I, I haven't finished the book, but but I, I think it's a very good, very good initiative to do this. But it, it's just a question, it's more out of curiosity. Um, the authors slip a sentence here and there about uh, shamanism and psychedelics and uh, this and and but they don't go there. Like for example, the, the one of the murals in Teotihuacan in Tepantitla. I mean, it, it's, it's, uh, it seems to be evident that that uh, the widespread of of mushroom was there. Uh, when they mention uh, Chavin, uh, Chavin de Guantar and Tiahuanaco also mentioned the Ana de um the plant and Vilca uh, and others. But again, they 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 don't they don't go there. And I, 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 again, sort of out of curiosity, what's the state of the art of this thinking of the role of these other states of consciousness and shamanism in creating structures of governance? Uh, so it's just uh, that's what I what I wanted to ask. Thank you, um, Alberto. Mark, would you like to add something before we, we go back to our, our guests? Yes, thank you. Um, this is a wonderful series. I appreciate it. You're organizing it and having these archaeologists involved. Um, I wanted to focus on what in chapter 10 is the, I think I've read the entire book, so I think it's the main theory that they're developing, that there are three ways that civilizations arise and then become oppressive. And that involves uh, the uh, charisma of heroic uh, leaders, uh, 
sovereignty emerging uh, through that. Um, and then also the control of knowledge with the uh, administrative system um, and the uh, control of behavior as well. So I'm wondering if those three factors that they're developing, how they relate back to the hope for hopeful evidence traces that they find of uh, alternatives, or even as they say, playing with um, these three in alternative ways, and especially how that might involve evidence that they briefly mention, for example, with Amoche in Peru of uh, female leaders, and yet there, there's still evidence of human sacrifice. So is, is, is there evidence in any of these areas or maybe others that um, alternatives emerged, even if they didn't survive, of more egalitarian systems uh, that, and did those involve female rulers with you know, different ways of ruling, because these authors also say that nurturing care of the dead, of the elite dead, is another way that kings become immortalized and oppressive. So, you know, that, that, that's what's most striking to me is that the book kind of confronts our desire, it, it elicits our desires for alternatives, like a more egalitarian system in the past somewhere that might arise again today, or more female rulership against the patriarchy. And yet, um, also mentions that those did not succeed. Thank you so much, Mark. I will ask any of the archaeologists in the room uh, who, who would like to respond to either or both of those questions. I guess I'll speak up. I'm not sure there was so much there that I'm not trying to figure out what aspect to respond to. And there were some points that came out that I'd, I think I'd, I'd like to focus on a little bit. Um, but just to kind of tie together uh, the, the relationship between religion and rulership is not always clear. And I agree that this was not fully addressed. I'm thinking of Alberto's comments about psychedelics and shamanism and healing and how this is represented in art. Um, the art at Teotihuacan and indeed the entire central ceremonial precinct there is, is really all about religious practices, including things that might connect to healing and psychedelics and, and this kind of stuff, although that's not my area of expertise. Um, and it, that's something that's missing, I think, in this discussion is just the tight relationship, the inseparable connection, I think, between religious authority and political authority, and at least in that case study. Whether that relates, I'll try and tie this around to the last question, but whether that relates to um, gendered rulership in some way, we don't know. We just know very little, especially with the, the, the lack of, uh, of written history that we can interpret at this point. We, I wouldn't be able to answer that question. Um, I do want to get back. There's, there's a comment that sparked my interest um, earlier about a lack of evidence and how, <laughs> coming back, Jennifer, that was your comment. Uh, and one of the areas where uh, there were interpretations made about, based on the lack of evidence uh, in the book had to do with Teotihuacan. I'm very Teo focused, as you can tell. I know there were other case studies here, but that's that's what I'm bringing to the discussion as my background and expertise. So I wanted to highlight this. Um, the authors, I think, seem to fixate on the lack of representation in art of, of a ruler, uh, the lack of portraiture. So there's that lack of evidence that they're running with and then interpreting that to mean a lack of the institution of kingship. And I don't know how many of you have been to Teotihuacan. In fact, some of you have your cameras on, so I can ask whether you've been there in person. Alberto, I know you have. I know that my student, Fernanda, my advisee, she's here. She doesn't have to raise her hand. I know she has stood there. Yes, a lot of you have been. Yes, hi, Fernanda. <laughs> so the reason I bring this up is that I, I just, 
I have to ask if you've stood there at the foot of these massive monumental pyramids in the heart of this civic ceremonial course surrounded by temples, dozens of temples, altars, temples, massive pyramids, and painted with murals, you know, showing these religious scenes, these scenes potentially of shamanism and healing and all of this. Um, has anyone stood in that spot and, and imagined a lack of rulers in that place? I think it would be so hard to convince any reasonable person standing there at the foot of all of that awe-inspiring monumentality. And it'd be hard to convince them that no, there were not kings here. There's no top-down authority. Um, what do you think, <laughs> Fernanda, Alberto? I mean, is that does this strike you as does this kind of counter your impressions, your experience of the place when you've been there? No, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's overwhelming. And, and you just imagine what would that be at that at that time. I mean, even even the descriptions from the conquerors when they encounter uh, well Tenochtitlan, not Teotihuacan, but but uh, it, it it's this marvel to to these uh, structures and obviously the 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 presence of something bigger that sort of oversees that is is evident. I think I, I don't know Fernanda if you want to add something. But... Actually, Alberto, yes, you mentioned something really important and. You know, when we <clears throat> think about the reverence that the Aztec Empire had for the Teotihuacanos and how they modeled a lot of, you know, the the um, <clears throat> the way that they viewed their society and how they developed it itself, um, if they were in awe of Teotihuacan itself, then the way that we see it today and, you know, it, the colors are not there and a lot of it, it's missing, but at its heyday, I can imagine that you don't need to have constant statues of all of the rulers everywhere for you to know that that was such an important place and that they were very much um you know the essence was very strong of the rulers and i think the monumentality would speak for itself as far as you know them having such such admiration and, and the representation for those those rulers themselves so i think uh just like when we see the um uh the ethnohistoric texts of Cortez walking into these, you know, to Tenochtitlan, um, and he expresses sort of such beauty and awe. I think we can also say that that might have been happening also in Teotihuacan as the Aztecs arrived at a city that was already abandoned. So I think the representation was there just because we don't have it. Um, I think the essence of the enormous, you know, area and that what it could expand to, I think that speaks volumes of the rulers and and knowing Mesoamerican societies, religion was so intertwined um, and ideology was such a heavy force that um, I think it's it's good to assume, you know, that they did have such a strong connection, but um, the monumentality itself, I think, speaks volumes of that. I guess what I'm seeing here, too, is that there is a prioritizing of figurative art and portraiture of rulers over that monumentality, over pyramids. And in the case of Teo, over the evidence for um, really impressive public works, like you know, engineering a new, new course of two rivers through the city, also the presence of a military. We know there's military might, we know there's monumentality. I'm wondering why we need Maybe this is a very limited view of what constitutes evidence of, of kingship, of rulership, why we need the pictures of kings. And in fact, when we look cross-culturally, so Inca empire, for example, we know there from histories, there were named kings, that these kings were considered to be divine and they weren't represented. There was not a tradition of figurative art in that context. And in, in fact, you know, where we have the representation of rulers in Mesoamerica, the Maya lowlands, for example, there's this tradition of representing rulers in art and all of their achievements, but we might wonder whether that's not a strategy for legitimizing and, and fortifying their, their authority for individuals that otherwise don't have limited actual, actual power, right? In the case of Teotihuacan, or certainly we know in the case of the Inca empire, um, you know, it might not have been necessary to to have portraits of rulers that is the power was not limited in that way 
Um, also, there, if a king is divine, I mean, truly divine, we have to think about perhaps a deliberate avoidance of representing that individual in art, um, maybe, you know, a prohibition against it, maybe it's a form of desecration, or maybe, especially in the context of animistic worldviews, in which sculptures, statues, stones are animated, that, that that would be too potent a force, right? Too powerful to actually depict, depict a divine ruler. So I just think they, they lean way too much on that. Um, anyway, that's lots of comments. I'm excited to hear. Thank you so much, Sarah. Um, and also Fernanda for uh, for uh, stepping in there when your advisor offered you the, the, the floor. That's... Uh, good stuff. Uh, so I want to ask uh, Katie to provide us a comment and then we'll go to Mark. Thank you so much. Um, this has been wonderful. And um, I, I just actually wanted to riff on what you just said, Sarah, and what's come up, I think, several times in, in Jenny's comment as well about lack of evidence. So it seems like there there is evidence for hierarchy for a lot of things and the evidence varies by um, by the site that's being looked at. Um, and I'm not an archaeologist, so I'll just say that. Um, where this is leading me is to ask the question to you in where would the evidence be for egalitarianism? So Graeber and Wengro want to say maybe consensus decision-making, maybe you know lack of representations given maybe a European framework for thinking about um, visual art. But in your opinion, where, I mean, if we did wanna say there could be more egalitarian evidence for egalitarianism, where should we then look for it? I'll keep this short because, I, Mark, I know you had your hand up, but I actually think they're on the right track and that many researchers, because they're they're really like entering a discussion that's already happening, right? This is not a rewriting of, of human history. This is a repackaging of, of research that's ongoing. And then they've done it in a very effective way that has, has reached a, a broader public. But um, really what we need, this research dealing with people's residential spaces, and the material culture that's there, what they had access to, they're on the right track. I think that they're just drawing conclusions prematurely given the small sample. That is, if we continue along these lines and we do these extensive excavations that are detailed and we understand you know, what are the qualitative differences in people's dwellings? How did most people in the society live? You know, is there any quality there? Are there clear differences in terms of, this is a new direction actually, in, in terms of access to uh, public services. So one of the areas at Teotihuacan that I think is under-researched is how close were people to um, water sources, for example, where do they, how far do, does any person have to travel from their from their home in order to obtain basic things that they need to be able to get to a temple, to water, to um, to anywhere that, you know, they might find the market, for example, that they might find the basic necessities of life. So looking at like movement through cities, looking at qualitative variation in, in residential architecture, and especially looking bioarchaeologically at evidence of declining health, perhaps increasing infant mortality, there are hints of that research already. I shouldn't say that, there's great research already. What I mean by saying hints is that there's not enough of it and we need more of it in order to really fully test the compelling hypotheses that, that these authors have, have, have uh, I, did, I don't wanna say they've come up with the hypotheses because again, I think these are hypotheses that have been discussed. These are research ideas that have been introduced by, by archeologists working in these, these areas, but they've, brought attention to these, these really interesting questions about egalitarianism. One more quick thing too, I think that they're kind of painting this as two options. That is either there's egalitarian societies or there's uh, totalitarian <laughs> rule, right? Uh, I think that there is, I mean, Mark, maybe, maybe you disagree, but I feel like there's, we can look at a continuum where we have um, more collective kinds of governments. Uh, and then on the other end, we have uh, more, authorita more authoritarian kinds of government, right? And figure out where does a society fit? I don't think it has to be this kind of dichotomy between the two. So I, I'm saying that with Ateo at least, and probably in other cases, I think there's room to envision 
people's participation in governance, like the existence of district or neighborhood councils, and have that not totally conflict with the idea of um, a sort of king or a ruling institution like a like a king or something, something along those lines. Mark, you, you had something to say there. Thanks for being patient with the mic. No, no, I actually wanted to ask you to follow up with that. Um, regarding what was mentioned before, I think by you and others, the monumentality of Teotihuacan. I visited decades ago, but I was impressed by it too. However, Graeber and Wengro, they focus on a period around 300 AD where they say there was a shift toward egalitarianism, uh, evidenced by the burning of the Temple of the Feathered Serpent, and yet that didn't last. So the earlier uh, building of the great pyramids and a more perhaps hierarchical or even patriarchal uh, society seem to, according to them, or they're looking for this evidence, uh, you know, has the possibility of shifting toward egalitarian, but then that being lost. So you're the expert. What did you feel about, think about that argument? It Thank you so much, Mark, for the for the question. I do want to make sure that we get back to the other Mark, though, Mark Knoyer, uh, <laughs> because I've been trying to bring you back in, Mark, for a few minutes. Please um, go ahead. Yeah, well, I, I'm going to address the same thing that Mark Pizzato just brought up. But the point is, and there's a question by Greg in the chat, which is addressing the same issues, is can you have a city that is egalitarian? And my opinion, and the pet opinion of most people who study ancient cities argues, no, a city by its definition is hierarchical. It is multi-ethnic, it's multicultural. It has, includes many different classes. Child's definition of a city is that it has different classes. So you cannot have an egalitarian city. Now people can choose to be participate in that hierarchical society when they walk through the gates, but they can also leave and the people who are leaving are the people who don't want to be a part of that hierarchy. So they're the herders, they're the traders, they're hunter gatherers who decide, I'm going to go live my egalitarian lifestyle out in the fields. And then when I want to involve myself with the hierarchy, I come through the gateways, I pay my taxes, and I sell my goods. So cities themselves, in my opinion, cannot be egalitarian. It just doesn't work. And there's no evidence that they are, because when you have that many people together in one area, you have to have some kind of hierarchical order, and that's what the state does. So the definition of the state, a state keeps the order of hierarchy vertically, and it keeps the interaction beyond key networks, which is horizontal. And so when you have more than, enough, more, more than a certain number of people that are not kin related, you have to have some kind of political organization to do it. So anyway, that's my opinion, and I think the opinion of many scholars, uh, sorry, that there is such a thing as an egalitarian civilization. The word civilization means members who, people who are members of a city. So civilization, if you're just going to term it any group of organization that is not urban, it's fine, but it's not a, an urban civilization. So that's just the, the main thing that we, I think we have to consider. And yes, there is community participation. There are people voting with their feet. There are people voting with their politics, with their, with their economic power to remove authoritarian rulers, and it fluctuates. But over time, you know, people are going, if people living in large concentrations need to have that kind of hierarchy. It just has to happen. Thank you, Mark. Oh, we're at time. We're at time. Would you believe it? I mean, that was a really uh, wonderful discussion. Gosh, I need to go back and read it again now, don't I? Now that I know more about archaeology on my on my path to formal affiliation with your uh, your great department uh, over in, Arche in in anthropology. There, um, I will simply say one that this this uh, book series, this book club series, reaches its thrilling finale next Wednesday. Nam Kim's going to come back in and also to uh, Mark Pizzato's point, he, I know uh, Nam has some uh, thoughts about chapter 10 in the book. We're also going to be joined by a historian uh, who is going to talk about it from the perspective of like what a, what a historian and sort of um, someone who's very involved in sort of public scholarship. 
um, uh, make of, of, of some of these com conversations and the contribution of the book as well. For now, it simply leads me to say thank you to um, Mark and to, um, and to Sarah for joining us today and for sort of driving forward this conversation, responding to people's comments. Thank you to uh, Cecil and, and Katie for coming back and adding to the conversation again. Thanks to everyone who showed up. So in many cases, for a third week in a row to talk about a 600 page book of archaeology. Eh? Who knew? Who knew how an intellectually vibrant place we are? Thank you, everybody. And uh, I hope to see many of you next week. Thanks a lot, Steve, and everybody else. Thanks, Sarah.